Now we'll start by talking a little bit about spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA. So this is a genetic neuromuscular disease characterized by muscle atrophy and weakness. So it affects one in 6,000 people, so it's still considered as a rare disease. And we still don't have any treatment for these kids, unfortunately. Um, so this disease has multiple forms, which vary in severity. And the most severe form is the type 1 that manifests before is six months of age and generally results in death before age 2. So <coughs> what we know about this disease is that it's caused by a decrease in production of functional SMN proteins. And these proteins affect the health and the survival of the motor neuron when they are at very low level in these cells. So the motor neurons are these nerve cells that you have in your spinal cord and that are responsible for muscle contraction. So <coughs> we know that this protein SMN that is produced at very low level in uh, the cells of SMA patients uh, is encoded by two genes, SMN1 and SMN2. So the sequence of these two genes is very similar, but the main difference is the presence of a cytosine at the position plus six of the SMN1 exon 7, whereas in the case of SMN2 exon 7, you will have at the same position a uridine. So this uh, nucleotide change will not ch change the uh, sequence of the protein at the end, but it will drastically change the spacing regulation of these two genes. So in the case of SMN1 exon 7, the presence of this cytosine will allow the recruitment of SRSF1, which is an SR protein, it's a splicing factor, and this splicing factor will then promote the inclusion of the exon 7, and the translation of this mRNA will uh, lead to the production of stable and functional SMN protein. In the context of SMN2, the fact that you have a uridine instead of this cytosine will prevent the binding of SRSF1, and instead promote the recruitment of HNRNPA1, which is another splicing factor that will have the opposite effect. So it will primarily promote the skipping of the exon 7. And in that case, this will lead to the production of unstable SMN protein. Okay, so that's for patients like you and me, but what's happening in the case of SMA patients? So in that case, they lost the functional version of their SMN1 gene, and they will only produce SMN protein from their SMN2 gene. So now we understand why they produce so low level of SMN proteins. Okay. But <coughs> what we also know is that they all contain at least one version of the SMN2 gene, which means that we could possibly act on the splicing of their SMN2 gene in order to increase the level of exon 7 inclusion and then the production of stable uh, SMN protein in their cells and possibly cure the disease. So there are several strategies that were developed in different labs. <coughs> so for example, in the lab of Daniel Schumperli in Switzerland, they try to use a primer, an oligo, that uh, is complementary to the three prime end of the exon 7 and contains a flanking sequence uh, with a binding site for a splicing activator. So in that case, they try to recruit a splicing activator to improve the inclusion of the exon 7, to increase the inclusion of the exon 7. In the lab of Adrian Krenner in US, they tried another strategy that consists in using an antisense oligonucleotide in order to prevent the recruitment of a splicing repressor, so HNRNPA1 in that case. And if you prevent, if you use an oligonucleotide that binds the binding site of the repressor, then the repressor cannot bind anymore, and then you activate the inclusion of the exon 7. So you can either recruit an activator or prevent the binding of a repressor. Uh, still another strategy that was developed in Franco Pagani's lab, so here, was to uh, try to promote the recruitment of the spliceosome, which is the machinery that is responsible for the splicing reaction, close to the exon 7 in order to promote the inclusion of this exon. And for that, they engineered a U1 SNRNP. So the U1 SNRNP is part of the uh, spliceosome machinery, and it's the uh, first part of this machinery that needs to be bound to the pre mRNA in order to then promote the assembly of the other uh, part of the spliceosome uh, machinery. So that's the first step. If you bind the U1 SRNP, then you can uh, have an assembly of the spliceosome. And they engineered this U1 SNRNP in order that 
he uh, has a highest affinity for the intron 7 than the endogenous uh, uh, U1SNRNP. And I was successful in promoting exon 7 in this context. One year ago, uh, a paper was published uh, at Roche, and uh, they identified three molecules that were able to increase specifically the inclusion of SMN2 exon 7. And they could ex also extend the lifespan of SMMIs. So this was also true for the other strategy that I presented before. But one advantage of these molecules is that they are already available and that I can penetrate into all tissues tested, so really all cells uh, of the patient. And what was interesting with this uh, paper was that they proposed that these molecules act on splicing regulators that are specific of SMN2 exon 7. So what are these splicing regulators? So you see them here. So in green, you have the splicing activators. In red, you have the splicing repressors. And of course, the outcome of the splicing will depend on the competition between all these factors. Okay. And we thought that if we could be able to solve structures of at least some of these splicing factors bound to the exon 7, perhaps we could find some new strategies uh, to cure uh, SMA. So we started to solve some structures. So we already solved structure of two repressors, PTB and HNRNPA1 bound to RNA. We started to work on the activator of exon 7 inclusion, HNRNPQ. And today I would like to uh, show you what we obtained with three uh, splicing uh, activators, SRSF1, HNRNPG, and TRA2 beta 1. And I will start with TRA2 beta 1. Okay? So TRA2 beta 1 um, is an SR protein, so it means that it contains an RS domain. So an RS domain contains a series of arginine serine dipeptides and is primarily involved in protein-protein interaction. And the domain that is really responsible for the specific interaction of TRA2 beta 1 with the exon 7 is the RRM. Uh, you will tell me what's an RRM. So an RRM is an RNA recognition motif, and it has a, a characteristic fold. So I don't know if you are used with structures, so I will ex try to explain a bit. Um, you see here in front uh, a beta sheet surface with four anti-parallel beta strands, and in the back, two alpha helices that are packed. Okay. So that's really the fold that you find for RRMs in general. And what we also find very often in this type of domain, and that's on the beta sheet surface, huh, that is uh, schematically represented here, is the presence of three aromatic residues that are in green, two, three, five. You find them here. They are very often found in RMs and they are very important for the interaction of RM with RNA. I will show you why. So here, do you, do you recognize the RM in gray? It's fine. Then you have the three aromatic residues in green here. And in front, you see the RNA molecule with the bases that are here and the backbone here. And what you see is that these three aromatic residues can actually uh, accommodate uh, dinucleotides, huh? one base and the second one. And what is happening is that actually the bases, these two bases, they will stack on the ring of the aromatics that are located in the middle of the beta strand, and the third aromatic will be inserted between the two riboses of this dinucleotide. So this will not provide specificity, but it will provide a lot of affinity. Okay? So that's the residues that are very important to have affinity between RMs and RNA molecules. Okay. So now I come back to TRA2 beta 1, for which we solve the structure bound to RNA. And again, you see that the RNA is interacting with the beta sheet surface of the domain. You find behind these three characteristic aromatics. Okay? But in that case, you see that it accommodate, they accommodate the three nucleotides instead of two. So actually, the nucleotide in the middle is bulged out. It adopts a thin uh, conformation and the two others stacked on the rings, similarly to what I showed you before. Okay, so what we also observe on this structure is that the two linkers between the RM and each RS domain are located here, and you see that, put it back, you see here that they cross each other. Do you see them here? Okay, they cross each other, and they will really clamp the RNA molecule on the beta sheet surface. And I will come back to this linker later. So keep it in mind. 
Okay, so the main information that we get out of this structure is that the RM binds a GAA motif specifically. So one RM binds to one GAA motif. And this is something that you can really get with the structure that you very often don't obtain with select data, clip data, or uh, other experiments, because what you observe very often is a repetition of the motif that is selected by the RM. But what is very useful with the structure is that it tells you what is the minimal motif bound by the domain. So once you have this information, what do we do? We go to uh, the, in vivo, the in vivo system, uh, and you see here the ESE2, the exonic splicing announcer located in the exon 7 of SMN, that was proposed to be the binding site of Trato Beta 1. And here you see that there are two GAA motifs. So the question was to know which one is responsible for the binding of Trato Beta 1 and for the activation of exon 7 inclusion when Trato Beta 1 is present. So for that, <coughs> to answer this question, we use an SMN2 milligene that contains exon 6, 7, and 8, transfected human cells with this gene. After, you extract, after splicing, you extract the total RNA, perform an RT-PCR using primers that are specific of this mini-gene. And then, that's the kind of results that you can observe. So in the presence of Trato Beta 1, you see a clear increase of exon 7 inclusion. But when we mutated the first putative binding site of a Trato Beta 1, you see that we observe a clear decrease of the level of exon 7 inclusion that we couldn't observe when we perform mutation in the second putative binding site of Trato Beta 1 indicating that Trato Beta 1 seems to bind the first GAA motif and to activate splicing when it binds this motif. Okay, so once you observe a structure, we always know that it's an in vitro structure. So the interaction that we observe in vitro should be validated in cells. And for that, what we usually do, uh, we uh, perform the same kind of experiments as I showed you before using the SMN2 minigene but we co-express a Y-type or mutated version of Trato Beta 1. And this mutated version of Trato Beta 1 corresponds to mutation of the residues that, uh, are, in that are uh, involved in the interaction of Trato Beta 1 with RNA. Then we see the effect on splicing. So this was a control. This valine is not involved in the RNA interaction. But as soon as we mutated one of the residues involved in the interaction, we observe a strong decrease of the exon 7 inclusion which indicate that what you observe here is most likely what is happening in cells. Okay, and now I would like to come back to this uh, story with the linkers, okay, between the RM and each RS domain. I told you that open RNA binding, they cross each other. And this is due to the fact that some residues that are located in these linkers interact directly with the RNA. So that's why they cross like that, because they contact the RNA, and that's what gives the directionality of this linker suggesting that um, it positions an RS domain upstream and one downstream, the Trato Beta 1 binding site. And it was proposed that these RS domains are responsible for the recruitment of another splicing activator, HNRNPG. So the question was to know whether HNRNPG was recruiting by Trato Beta 1 upstream or downstream Trato Beta 1 binding site. So for that, we first had to understand what was the sequence recognized by HN or NPG. And for that, we again saw the structure. And this is the structure that you obtain for the complex. So you see that, again, the RNA binds the beta sheet surface, that the C-terminus is involved in this interaction. And the most important information in this context is that HN or NPG bind a AAN motif. So N is for any nucleotides. That's the information that we have. Then we go back to the exonic splicing announcer and checked on each side of Trato Beta 1 whether we could find some adenine tracks. And we found some upstream Trato Beta 1 binding site. But again, we had two possibilities. And the question was to know which one is really bound by, by HNRNPG. So we used the same approach as for uh, Trato Beta 1. We first mutated the a tract position at the 5' prime extremity of the ESE. And you see here that we observe a decrease in exon 7 inclusion when we uh, express HNRNPG. When we mutated the second track of adenines, we had a similar effect. And when now we mutated both uh, tracts, 
we have even a strongest effect, indicating that both a tracts seems to be important for HNRNPG binding and activity in SMN2 exon 7 splicing. So what we think is that you have an avidity effect. The fact that you have two poly A tracts close to each other increase locally the affinity of HNRNPG for uh, SMN2 exon 7. But what it also shows is that it increases the specificity of interaction of this protein with SMN exon 7. And that's something that is important because very often you will, I guess you noticed that when you have an RNM, it will recognize three to six uh, nucleotides, not more. And uh, of course, these three to six nucleotides, you will find them everywhere. And it doesn't mean that they will bind everywhere. It depends on the competition between these four factors. And in that case, it shows that it's not only a question of competition, it's also a combination. The fact that you have two proteins that recognize two single motifs will be co-recruited on RNA in order to have a, a higher affinity, uh, specificity. So now it's not only a protein that binds GAA and another one that binds AA. A, it's two proteins that bind uh, AA and, and, and GAA sequence. I, is it clear what I mean? Yeah? Okay. So then we think and we believe that uh, stabilizing the, stab the interaction of this heterodimer on uh, exon 7 would be a good strategy uh, to cure SMA. So now I would like to uh, discuss a bit the result that you obtain with a third splicing activator, SRSF1. So SRSF1 is also an SR protein. It contains an RS domain at the C-terminal extremity and has the particularity to have two RNA recognition motifs, RM1 and RM2. When we have a look at the sequences that are found on the beta sheet surface of these RMs, we see that for the RM1, we find this uh, conserved aromatics. So it's a canonical RM. You remember these aromatics huh, that are important for the binding that I presented before? So we find them in this RM. But what was interesting was that we couldn't find them in uh, the RM2. So the RM2 is actually not a canonical RM, it's an uncanonical RM that is called pseudo-RM. And we were very interested in, uh, in trying to understand how this pseudo-RM could interact with RNA in the absence of these aromatics that we know are very important to provide affinity. So we solved the structure of this domain bound to RNA. And you can see here that the RNA doesn't interact at all with the beta sheet surface like all the other complexes that I presented before the RNA interact with the side of the domain. So the fold of uh, this RM is very similar to what you find with canonical RM. Oops, sorry, I need to use the mouse, okay. Yeah. So you have the beta sheet surface in front, then two alpha helices that are packed in the back, and you have a long beta hairpin, you see here? So it's two beta strands, that bring this uh, histidine at the vicinity of this adenine. And what you see is that the RNA is really wrapped at the bottom of this alpha-1 helix. Okay? So three nucleotides are specifically recognized. This guanine that interacts by two hydrogen bonds with the backbone of this alanine located on the beta-2 strand. And you see that this base stacks on this uh, tryptophan that is located in the alpha helix. Then we have the second guanine in 2 that interacts via three adrenaline bonds with residues that are also located in the alpha-1 helix, and the last adenine that interacts via one adrenaline bond with this aspartate also located in alpha helix 1. So most of the interaction are with this helix, and the linker between the two RMs lies on the beta sheet surface and brings this arginine at the vicinity of these two guanines. So the structure clearly shows that a GGA motif is specifically recognized by this domain. And it also indicates that the two guanines have extensive contacts with the protein, whereas the adenine has only one adjacent bond with the protein. So you would expect the protein to be more specific for a GG than for a GGA. And to test this, we used uh, some mutation in the RNA molecule and test their interaction with stratobita 1 by ITC measurement. So this is what you observe with the Y type. So we have a KD of one micromolar. As soon as we mutate one or the other guanine, you see that we lose the binding, the binding. But in good agreement with our structure, when we substitute this adenine by a uridine, we have a 
an effect on the affinity that is by, uh, decreased by a factor 3, but that is clearly less drastic than what you observe with the mutation on the guanines. So, in summary, the ITC data confirm what you observe with the structure. The protein binds very specifically to consecutive guanines and prefer an adenine at this position, but there is some flexibility. So then, we mutated the residues that were involved in the interaction, the, the residues from the protein that were involved in the interaction and had an effect, uh, and had a look at the effect on the affinity, and you see that all of them decrease the affinity by a factor 5 to 10, so it means that they are all absolutely required for the interaction, and what is interesting is that they are actually all conserved, and we could show that this mod, this uh, this mode of interaction that is uncanonical is conserved for all the pseudo-RM that we tested in human, but also in drosophila, in yeast. So all the domains have these residues and they will be used in order to bind the RNA on the side of this domain. So we can predict uh, what will be uh, the sequences bound by this domain in other proteins. So that's also an advantage of structural studies. Okay, so... I come to the acknowledgement. So I would like to uh, thank Frédéric Alain for his constant support and uh, interest in 2D topics. Uh, Ahmed Morsi, who is a uh, talented PhD student working in our lab, uh, who solved the structure of HNRNPG bound to RNA, and uh, he's working also with me on these SMA systems, uh, and our collaborator in Basel, in Basel so Mihaela Zavolan, Hadi Georgiani, and Nitish Mittal, who performed the analysis of the SELEX data that I presented at the end and the whole group, the fundings, and you for your attention.